What does the FNAF fan game Final Nights 4 hide from the player off camera? Final Nights 4 is the fourth and currently final installment in this haunting series of fan games. Today, we'll be exploring an array of grim locations, as well as meeting a vibrant cast of, well, not so vibrant animatronics. In this video, we'll be taking a look out of bounds in search of things we're not typically supposed to see, including one of the largest animatronics I have ever seen. There's a lot more than that as well. So I hope you enjoy this look behind the scenes of Final Nights 4. Spooky supporters of the channel help out a ton, so a big thanks to Town Survivor Zombie Haunt for doing just that. Town Survivor is a tower defense-like strategy game where you must take shelter in a building alongside teammates while continually reinforcing it and building weapons. In Town Survivor, you don't want to be this guy. Be these other guys! <laughs> So you run to a room, earn coins, and then build and upgrade weapons to defend yourself. Also, try to pick up the chest before you go to a room at the start, as it will help out a ton. As you protect your town from wave after wave of zombies, every decision is going to count. Every player will get a coin gift pack for starting out to help you survive. So click the link down below to download Town Survivor today. And a big thanks to Town Survivor for sponsoring this video and supporting me as a creator. As always, I'll do a quick recap. That way we're all refreshed on what we'll be covering. The game starts off showing a quick cutscene where a paranormal investigator named Max Donovan is given an anonymous tip on the disappearance of Henry Stillwater. Throughout the game, you'll swap between standard FNAF-inspired gameplay and point-and-click investigations as you complete each night. When playing as Henry, you must survive five nights in this horrific Fred Bear's restaurant as an array of animatronics attempt to reach you, with each night bringing a new robotic adversary. You must lead Fredbear through the restaurant using an alarm in order to prevent him from shutting the power off, as well as keeping tabs on Spring Bonnie as they wander through this establishment. The Puppet Master will be activated on Night 2, and you must watch him frequently to prevent him from reaching your office. On Night 3, Proto Spring Bonnie will be awakened, and you must use the Air Refresh button whenever he stops moving, and failing to do so enough times will result in him jump scaring you. On Night 4, Proto Spring Freddy will begin making his way to your office through the vents and you must seal off the duct above your office at the right time to repel him. Lastly, on Night 5, Insane Freddy and Bonnie will be the only present threat. You must locate them on the cameras and activate the alarm in whichever room they appear in to prevent them from jump scaring you. After completing the fifth night, you'll begin a point-and-click escape sequence where you will ultimately be stuffed into a Fredbear suit by the Insane animatronics. Now, there is just too much to cover in a single summary, so we'll be going over the investigations a bit later in the video. But with the general recap out of the way, let's check out the title screens. So there are a handful of these screens to check out, as this menu changes with each chapter we complete. This first title screen swaps between the spring animatronics and their prototype counterparts. In zooming out, we can see that the animatronics not currently visible on screen will be stored underneath the others. And after enough time has passed, they will instantly swap out again. There's a bunch of furniture and other Fredbear plushies flooding around the background, but that's it for this title screen, so let's move on to the next. In this screen, we will see the Reaper animatronics appearing in front of the camera. If we move the camera back, we can actually see that each of these animatronics is stored on the right side just off camera. When the swap occurs, a new animatronic will be placed in front of the camera, and the other will be moved back to their waiting position off screen. After achieving the good ending, the title screen will show the burnt rubble of Fredbear's, I believe, and in the background, we can see a large city. Moving the camera back, we can see how the scene is actually set up. The city visible in the background is actually massive compared to the area we actually see. And between these two locations, we will find a large body of water. Compared to these background assets, this title screen is absolutely tiny. Finally, we'll take a look at the menu showcasing the insane animatronics. So the screen typically shows Freddy and Bonnie in front of a wall static, and the menu in its entirety has this glitchy effect applied to it. If we turn these effects off though, well, it's not as scary. This is actually the same location that the first title screen took place in, except the animatronics have been replaced, and the effects applied to this scene make it look completely different. That's it for the title screens though, so let's jump into the gameplay portion and see what we can find hidden on nights 1-5. through five. So the first thing I want to do is take a look at this office area from another perspective. We will be spending all five nights within this office, and from another angle, it is definitely a bit claustrophobic in here. We have practically no room to move around, as right behind our chair is a brick wall. Flying around the rest of the office, though, there is some pretty interesting stuff for us to look at. For starters, there is this huge stack of screens hovering just outside of the pizzeria. Almost all of these screens are currently blank, but at the very bottom, we'll find the security camera overlay and a screen completely covered in static. 
When the player is actively using the security cameras, the room they are viewing will be activated within this stack and moved down inside the UI panel. There is also a screen off to the side that changes depending on which camera is currently active. When the player uses this surveillance system, their camera is quickly moved over to this location directly in front of this main panel. Now if we head back inside and fly over to the stage, we can see both Spring Bonnie and Fredbear standing side by side. Now when the Zamatrox leave this stage to walk around, the camera will be briefly covered by static. The reason for this is because these specific models that we see on stage are not the same ones that walk around this map. The moment either of these animatronics leaves the stage, these particular models are moved beneath the map, where they will remain for the rest of the night. If we look just above the ceiling, we can actually see the mobile versions of these animatronics are stored out of bounds until their stage counterparts are moved off screen. And when this occurs, the screen goes staticky while this swap is taking place. After Fredbear left the stage, I followed him around for a bit, which was kind of cool because we only ever see these guys walking around from within the cameras. Next, I want to take a look at something I'm sure a ton of you are curious about. So when Spring Bonnie enters our office to scan for intruders, they will enter through our office door. But what does this look like from another perspective? Well, for starters, moving the camera into the hallway, we'll find that Bonnie has mastered their clone jutsu. The Spring Bonnie that wanders through this building actually freezes the moment they reach the end of our hallway and the model that was previously beneath the stage is moved back inside the map to play out this sequence. We can watch this happening from a different perspective as they slowly enter our office and hunch over in the player's face. Even though I know I am completely safe, this is still incredibly unnerving. They stare blankly for a moment before standing upright again and piecing out. As they leave our office and reach the end of the hallway, this copy will be moved underneath the map again as the walking model resumes its patrolling duties. So skipping ahead to night three, we can see that Proto Spring Bonnie is now active and making his way through the pizzeria. We can take a closer look at this freaky prototype and watch them as they limp through the halls. They are a lot less cartoon-like than their newer counterparts, and they're especially creepy with the lights off. Typically, they'll enter our office through the doorway, lean down next to the vent, and the screen dips to black. When the light comes back on, they're no longer in our office. If we watch this from a different angle, we can actually see that they simply bend down and warp instantaneously to another location. You'd never see this happening though, as the screen goes completely dark. Coming into night four, Proto Spring Freddy will immediately make a dash for the vents, which he will use to access the hatch above the player's office. Moving the camera over there, we can watch Freddy as he crawls inside the ducts. He stops at the end, and viewing this from the other side, we can see his head is completely upside down. Heading over to our office, we can take a closer look at what he looks like in that overhead vent. He looks, uh, very sinister as he watches us from above, patiently waiting for his chance to kill us. With this face watching me from the vents, I can't help but miss Mangle a little bit. After we close the hatch and block Freddy from entering our office, he immediately warps away. But instead of entering another vent, he just, uh, crawls through the wall? I'm not sure why he chose to use the wall when there was a vent 10 feet behind him, but whatever works for you, man. Afterwards, he just stands up like nothing ever happened, and then immediately makes a beeline for our office once more. So finally, on night five, the rest of the cast will be replaced by Insane Freddy and Bonnie. These animatronics work differently than the rest, as they will only appear within the pizzeria when they're trying to kill you. When they load in, they glitch around violently, and they are so insanely fast, it's hard to keep track of them. Even after slowing the game way down, they still move extremely quickly. At this point, I want to see what happens when they jump scare you. But when I move the camera and let them kill me, well, nothing happened. It was then that I realized that this jump scare doesn't take place within the pizzeria itself. The Amatrox used for the jump scare are actually stored just beyond the walls of this map, inside of this bright white light. When the player is jump scared, the camera is simply teleported in front of them as their animation plays out. But that's it for nights one through five. So let's dive into the investigations. So during these investigations, you play as the paranormal investigator Max Donovan, as he attempts to uncover the horrific truth behind his nightmarish franchise. In these segments of the game, you'll explore several locations in a classic point-and-click style of gameplay. You must solve puzzles and locate items that are required to progress, and ultimately play a minigame or two on each night. During the first investigation, you show up outside of Fredbear's family diner. 
You must open the trunk to grab a wind-up flashlight and the key to this building. And once inside, you will need to find a way to disable this steaming pipe. You have to find the code to unlock this door, and also find a way to break these boards. A step ladder must be used to look over the top of this bathroom stall, so we can grab the axe lodged in this guy's head. Afterwards, you break the boards, turn the pipe off that blocks your path, and then approach the puppet master. You have to shine the flashlight on his hand puppet, and avoid flashing him with your light directly. That's it for this investigation, so let's rewind time and take a closer look at this map. So to start, the room that we see in this opening cinematic isn't actually a complete room. It is merely a stage built to look like a room from the camera's fixed perspective. Also, we can find the notepad and newspaper that we viewed during this cutscene floating just off to the side. Inside the parking lot area that we start in, we can take another look at this parking lot from a different perspective, which is pretty cool considering we only ever see this from fixed camera angles. All the buildings surrounding this area are fully modeled, but they are completely empty inside. Speaking of these buildings though, on top of this factory in the background, we will see a billboard that says Polypixel Freebie Pack. This is a free resource pack that was most likely used when the devs were creating these large buildings. Back inside of that parking lot, if we look to our right, we will see what looks like Shadow Spring Bonnie for just a second before they leave that window. Moving the camera over there, we can take a closer look at their model. They are textured as solid black with yellow teeth and eyes. They will continue to glare out this window until the player looks at them, after which they will then move off to the side. That's not the only thing hidden off camera though, because just beside the entrance to the building is a flat image of some asparagus. I'm not sure why this is placed here, but do what you will with the information. When we open the car trunk, we can see that the car itself unloads and is replaced by this open trunk model. We can find this same trunk model just outside of this chain link fence, except this one is completely empty. If we fly way outside of the map, we can actually find another copy of the trunk that is full of items, except the items within this trunk are organized a bit differently. There's also this black platform containing an empty backpack, but that's it for the stuff outside, so let's head into the pizzeria itself. After entering through the front door, we are moved to a completely new map. Now, what's interesting is that this map is actually a heavily altered version of the Fredbear's location we play on during regular gameplay. Underneath the map, we will find uh, a giant pair of keys and our flashlight. They are stored just beneath the map, and they are gigantic. Moving the camera into the bathroom where we get the axe, I want to take a closer look at the man inside this stall. If we look at his face from below, we'll see that he's actually a zombie. His mouth is covered in blood and his eyes are clearly zombified. I'm not sure what I expected here, but it definitely wasn't this. During this investigation's minigame, we must keep the Puppet Master in check with our flashlight. They are stored directly beneath this stage until they are called into the map, where they will then just clip through the floor. Right next to the puppet we can actually find our flashlight, perpetually winding up off screen. When we look down to wind our flashlight, it is actually moved in from out of bounds, and the moment we look back up it shoots outside of the map again. Moving on to the next investigation, we arrive at William Afton's house in the middle of the night. We must grab a pair of shears from the shed in order to open the gate, and then Burnt Freddy will break down the door. We must then grab the parts required to obtain the crank, which we will then use to free the spirits trapped within the animatronics. After freeing Bonnie, Chica will chase us through the house, and we must hide behind the stairs. Afterwards, we will go upstairs and play a minigame where we must keep our light on Chica to prevent her from getting closer, while also using the crank on Freddy when he approaches. After we release both these animatronic spirits, we will then go outside and burn their robotic corpses. So going back in time, this map is actually pretty huge. We can get an aerial view of the house we will eventually be entering, but flying inside, we will see that it is mostly empty. If we take a look inside the shed, where we find Burnt Foxy though, we'll find that the interior is completely hollow. So when we enter the shed, the camera is actually moved way out into the woods where the actual shed is stored. It is just sitting out here in the woods, surrounded by trees, and inside, we can take a closer look at Burnt Foxy. Not far from the shed, we can also find another copy of that backpack we saw earlier. Upon entering the house, we can watch from the inside as Burnt Freddy detaches his feet and breaks down the door. I get that it's polite to take your shoes off when entering someone's home, Freddy, but this is just ridiculous, man. When this cutscene begins, we are moved to a completely different map as well. Underneath the house, we can find Freddy floating next to what I believe is the door he knocked down earlier. He's just chilling down here with his detached feet, and just behind him is also that crank that is used on the animatronics. 
that's not the only thing hidden out of bounds though. As right beside this house, we can find a massive version of the Puppet Master sticking out of the ground. His body extends way, way down into the void below, and only the top half of his head is sticking through the ground. You can typically only see a small portion of his head from inside, but this is what that actually looks like. On top of the roof though, we can also find a normal sized Puppet Master as well. So when Chica chases the player through the house, we hide under the stairs to evade her. If we move the camera over to the entrance during this chase though, we can see Chica just kind of leaning through the wall. We can see her head poking through the other side, which is pretty funny. Inside the attic, we can watch from another perspective what happens when we free Chica's spirit. The crank slowly rises upwards as she stands facing Freddy, and the moment it is twisted, a large cloud of what looks like smoke explodes out of her head. She quickly moves forward and changes into a sitting pose as she contemplates her life choices. During the next investigation, we must find a way to enter this large abandoned hospital. We must grab the crowbar that is wedged in the front door, use it to enter the sewers where we will find a code, and then use that code to turn the power on in the hospital. After opening the garage door, we then head into the hospital where we make our way upstairs. Once upstairs, we must find a code to enter the storage closet where we will acquire a screwdriver. The screwdriver is then used to access the panel in the elevator where we must complete another puzzle to turn it back on. We then head to the top floor to play a mini game with Reaper Toy Chica. And after completing this, we will then play a game heavily similar to Final Nights 3 where we must fend off the Reaper animatronics. So there isn't a ton to look at off screen during this investigation, but after we enter the hospital, we can take a look at how this map is put together. Each floor of this hospital is actually stored separately from one another, and they're stacked on top of one another right next to this large factory. When the player uses the stairs or the elevator, they're simply warped between these locations. When we start the Final Nights 3 minigame, however, we are taken to a whole new map. Underneath the hospital room, we will find each of the animatronics that we will encounter just waiting out of bounds, including each of the Reaper animatronics and the Fred Bear plushies. We can also take a closer look at Bloom Boy, and he's somehow even creepier in this game. I mean, the dude's face looks like it's melting. Now the final point and click segments in this game actually take place during the game's endings. After completing Night 5, the player will have to try and escape Fred Bear's family diner. You must make your way through the pizzeria, shutting your eyes whenever the insane animatronics confront you. After grabbing the keys though, you will then be jump scared and a cutscene plays out showing the player being stuffed into a Fredbear suit, ultimately becoming entwined Fredbear. Viewing this from another angle, we can see what happens as we're being stuffed into that suit. The insane animatronics will remain in that office area for the time being, and we can see that there's now a Fredbear suit lying in that hallway. The player's camera simply moves inside the Fredbear mask, and Insane Bonnie and Freddy begin clipping through the walls to look at the player. They will just sort of float there, staring at us until this cutscene ends. Now, there are two interrogation segments that take place between these investigations, and the answers you choose while being questioned by Entwined Fredbear will ultimately decide which ending you get. In the bad ending, the game simply ends after we are stuffed into that suit, and alternatively, the good ending takes us to Fazbear's Fright, where we are then instructed to burn it down. So when we arrive outside of Fazbear's Fright, we can see that we are inside of what looks like an amusement park of some kind. And behind the main building, we can actually find an entire roller coaster in this open space. It's kind of funny because this roller coaster takes up more space than all these buildings combined. Beyond that, there isn't a whole lot to see out here, so let's head inside. So after entering this, we're meant to start the gas and begin burning the attraction down. However, we are stopped by Springtrap as we attempt to leave. We can take a look at this spring-locked monstrosity up close, and I kind of wish I didn't. He's definitely something to look at. Springtrap then knocks the player out, and the game cuts to its credits. Now that the game has been completed, there are a couple things I want to check out. For starters, let's take a look at the museum. The museum in this game actually has multiple rooms to explore, with each of them being based on the chapters in the game itself. Similar to the way the hospital worked, each room within the museum is actually stacked on top of each other. When you touch one of the doors in the entrance, you will simply be teleported to the corresponding room within this map. Inside of the museum, you can see each of the animatronics that we encounter throughout the game, as well as a room showing off some of the game's unused content. We can also find a bunch of hospital objects stored out of bounds. These objects include a cork board, a wheelchair, a hospital cart, and a privacy screen. Each of these objects can also be found inside the museum itself, but I'm not sure why these are out here. Aside from the museum, you will also unlock the chapter select screen. And this screen allows you to go back and replay each of the game's chapters. 
If we turn the lights on and move the camera back, we can see how this menu actually works. The animatronics are all relatively close together, and the camera is placed in the center of them all. That way, the camera can simply rotate between each of them. It's definitely a bit odd seeing these scenes in a single shot, though. Finally, while looking through the game files, I found a map simply titled Rare Boot. And the only thing within this map is a cube, with this creepy, staticky image overlaid on top of it. It kind of looks like two animatronics standing beside each other, but I can't make out what is on these for sure. So the term boot is typically associated with starting an application or opening something. So my hunch is that this map is or was used for a random chance occurrence that could happen when starting the game or loading a different map. I can't be sure though. But with that, we've come to the end of Final Nights 4. I hope you enjoyed this lengthy dive into this terrifying fan game series. And if you did, subscribe now for more Final Nights of Freddy's content in the near future. Thanks for watching everyone, and cheers.